Gene Meyer and Leonard Leo have been outstanding leaders and have built the Federalist Society literally from starting from scratch up into this huge organization, which I believe is the, the most successful and one of the largest and most significant organizations in the conservative movement over these several years. The founding fathers knew that like any other part of the government, the power of the judiciary could be abused. If you look back to even the early 1980s, President Reagan was appointing very important new judges and new justices. They were taking a new approach toward certain very important legal questions. That was not being taught uh, in the law schools and wasn't even really welcome in a lot of law schools. So there was no kind of uh, consensus, no firm idea of what it meant to be uh, a, a conservative uh, with regard to the law, somebody who uh, favored uh, liberty, uh, the, the framers' vision of the Constitution. Uh, what legal principles uh, did that translate into? The Federal Society stepped in. They just had this idea that they would, that, that, that law school campuses needed more balance and they were gonna bring that balance to it. And they started off by bringing speakers and hosting debates on the law school campuses. That small nucleus of conservative law students is really changing the debate in the law schools in this country. The Federalist Society is in the forefront of the fight to reform our legal system that has grown into a national organization which now includes lawyers and legal scholars as well as students. The group together has done an amazing job, but the day-to-day -day leadership of Gene and Leonard has been very fundamental to that success and that growth, where I believe now measures 70,000 different members, which has chapters in virtually every accredited law school, and also has something like 100 different lawyer chapters. It's helped people who are out of law school really just continue their legal education. It brought together all the various strands of the conservative movement. That's no surprise when Gene Meyer was born into fusionism. His father, Frank Meyer, was the original fusionist. And so the Federalist Society has created a, just a huge network of people who think similarly about the Constitution and the importance of the rule of law. We did not envision, to tell you the truth, that the student group would grow into a national organization big enough or prominent enough to be addressed by the President of the United States. You've earned a reputation across the ideological spectrum for open debate and intellectual rigor. On behalf of our country and the Constitution, we are grateful for all you have done. I think Leonard's there. He's there making everything happen. We're supposed to judge a judge's work and whether they're coherent and rigorous and, and fair and objective. And Gene, in my mind, embodies the Ronald Reagan maxim that you can accomplish so much good if you don't care who gets the credit. All of our chapter and practice group officers, student chapter and lawyers chapter officers and practice group officers and leaders, you are the core of the Federal Society. You are the one who does the work. I would really, really appreciate what you do. Thank you. Leonard and Gene are, are different in a lot of ways. You're having a best dress contest, that goes to Leonard. If you're looking for the best chess player, uh, that goes to Gene. But uh, as I've thought about this, you know, they share one really important trait in common, that they've been self-effacing and they've been selfless. That's a pretty rare thing in Washington. If you look for why has the Federal Society been successful, I'm confident uh, that's part of it. That uh, what's been most important to them, it's been the ideas, it's been the other people. I think that Gene and Leonard deserve the prize for leadership and political thought because in many ways they are emblematic of what Bill Buckley himself stood for, and that was civilized discourse, vigorous debate, and also the idea that people could disagree without being disagreeable. And due to the leadership of Gene and Leonard, I think you will see that the Federalist Society has a great opportunity to continue to grow and to continue to carry on the great work that they have started. So now let me turn to the men of the hour.
uh, Leonard Leo and Eugene Meyer, who are recognized tonight, well, I'm tempted to say they're recognized for saving the United States of America. As many of you in this room know, I'm not exactly an eternal optimist. I've now been writing for National Review for just about as many years as I was a federal prosecutor. And after, new, after nearly two decades in journalism, uh, I often wonder why I left the comparative safety of jihadist terrorism. <laughs> but I haven't lost my faith that we will preserve, protect, and defend America, which at bottom means we will preserve, protect, and defend her constitution. I've never wanted to be any place other than National Review because that's what we're fighting for every day. And from this vantage point, it's easy to see that if we succeed, no institution in American life will be more responsible for that than the Federalist Society. And no two pillars of that institution will deserve more of the credit than Leonard Leo and Jean Meyer. Indulge me a personal aside. The Federalist Society, the American court system, and the great cause of limiting government so that freedom can flourish lost a great champion in this last sad year. Ralph Winter, the peerless longtime judge of the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and a venerable longtime professor at Yale Law School, passed away at 85. It was one of the great joys of my life to have befriended Judge Winter. And of all the many things he had to boast about in his illustrious career, one that he seemed to be most proud of was his pioneer's role as the first faculty advisor of the first Federalist Society chapter at Yale Law School. That was in the early 1980s. It was the ascendancy of constitutional conservatism, of originalism and textualism, of Attorney General Ed Meese, Judge Bob Bork, Justice Antonin Scalia. The Federalist Society, though committed as much to testing our ideas through debate, even more wanted to proclaim our ideas. But the basic commitment of the Federalist Society has always been honest debate, testing our ideas. That was what Judge Winter would stress when I had conversations with him. To make the right impact on the law and on the country, we would need to engage in civil discourse with all comers. No regnant orthodoxy with one voice barred from the door. Real rigor, real exchanges, and real diversity of thought. Confident that constitutional conservatism and the libertarian spirit would prevail because they had the soundest views, not by rigging the game. Well, that small handful of pioneering chapters has grown to become freedom's fortress. The Federalist Society now has chapters in 200 law schools across the country and over 100 American cities. As you've heard, there are now about 70,000 lawyers who boast their proud membership in the society, including several in this room. And the best part of that, to my mind, is that the boasts get just a little bit louder, just a little bit more determined, when every now and then our friends in the progressive legal orthodoxy try in vain to push the Federalist Society to the side. They figure, that's not our kind of diversity. Well, it is our kind of diversity. The two visionaries who have fostered that growth, guided it, and tended it every step of the way for nearly 30 years are Leonard and Jean. As you've seen, each of them is brilliant and accomplished in his own right, but each of them has always raised the mission above personal plaudits, and has the mission ever succeeded. The Federalist Society has flourished not only in the academic ivory towers and the nation's most influential bar associations, it has flourished in the courts throughout the United States at every level of government. 
It has ensured that no public policy debate can be decided without consideration of federalism, of limited constitutional government, of the separation of powers that ensures genuine space for individual liberty. Over 30 years, Leonard and Jean have not merely built a powerful, influential institution. They have changed the terms of our debate. They have made it plausible to argue that the Supreme Court must revisit some of its worst excesses in judicial legislating because those rulings have no mooring in constitutional jurisprudence, statutory law, or the American tradition. And over the previous four years, Leonard, Jean, and the Federalist Society took the lead role in helping President Trump and Senator Mitch McConnell reshape the federal judiciary. To the point, <laughs> reshape the federal judiciary to the point that we have achieved something that many of us would have thought impossible just a short time ago, a constitutional conservative majority on our nation's highest court. I won't pretend that the news is not grim these days, but we will save the United States. We will save this country. National Review is going to play the steadfast role our founder, Bill Buckley, conceived for it, just as it always has. And we will always be proud to say, all of us, that we stood shoulder to shoulder with our richly deserving honorees of the Buckley Prize for Leadership in Political Thought. Ladies and gentlemen, Leonard Leo and Eugene Meyer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'd like to actually think of the Federal Society as standing athwart the 21st century yelling, think. This is a century whose far left is well on its way to questioning or even denouncing the value of debate, discussion, and even reason, all of which are the building blocks of civilization. More of this in a moment, but first I want to express how honored I am to receive this award and my thanks to the National Review Institute and its board, thanks to Andy for his kind works, and I think my parents would be especially pleased and even believe the kind words in the video. I, I know my brother John is pleased, and is my son Samuel Frank Meyer, who makes me especially determined to leave him a world where those building blocks remain. But, but the award, as grateful as I am for it personally, symbolizes for both Leonard and me a tribute to the work so many have done, many of them in this room, to help the Federal Society support these building blocks of civilization. The commitment to these building blocks and to thinking is central to the Federal Society. And to me, it's both a family and a National Review tradition. I remember on more than one occasion, my father bellowing in the living room in exasperation, feel, 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 damn it, don't people think anymore? <laughs> and NR, from its earliest days, stressed its willingness to debate liberals anytime, any place, anywhere, on any subject. And of course, for me, I remember with fondness as a kid, uh, Bill Buckley, while visiting my father, presenting me with chocolate cigarettes. <laughs> Unfortunately, this led to a lifetime addiction <laughs> to chocolate. <laughs> but back to thinking, what does this entail? Being serious about ideas and being determined to support good ones, but also being civil to those who have what we view as wrong-headed views. Assume they are wrong-headed and not evil. All of those with intellectual commitment should make it a point to fully understand uh, those they most disagree with. The pluses of doing so are many. First, once you do that, you'll probably will still disagree strongly, but are less likely to view the person as evil. Secondly, you'll have a far better idea of how to reach them, and thereby some chance to persuade them. Third, there's always the possibility you may learn something from them. And fourth, you can counter their arguments much more effectively when you really understand them. All this is part of reason, debate, and discussion. 
Understanding is so critical because from classrooms to boardrooms, there's huge pressure to establish identity politics as our commanding regime. One striking and painful recent example comes from Northwestern Law School, which had a town meeting online recently that unfolded as follows. The first administrator said, quote, my name is Emily Mullins, and I am a racist and a gatekeeper of white supremacy. I will try to be better, close quote. The next administrator said, my name is Sarah Somerville, and I am a racist. I will try to do better, close quote. Then the dean of the law school said, I am Jim Spetta, and I am a racist. These ritualistic denunciations of oneself, these pseudo-confessions in different form, permeate the landscape. This behavior goes beyond chilling. It attacks freedom of thought. Ironically, the attacks most prevalent at universities, but similar pressures permeate everywhere, from the tech world to law firms to Fortune 500 companies. The prominent examples of Delta, Airlines, Coke, and major sports leagues indicate how deeply imbued in our society these attitudes are. Employees working in major companies at whatever level believe they have to say things even when they don't really believe them, lest they are significantly damaged professionally. Others fear firing for unpopular opinions or activities, which would be tolerated or even praised coming from an approved perspective. And the fear is reasonable. Not a day goes by without a new story of someone being ostracized or fired for saying something that someone somewhere found offensive. How do we counter these very serious challenges we face today? Civilization survives and indeed flourishes when good citizens rise to such challenges. That is how our country was founded. It was revolutionary in many ways, including a genuine commitment to freedom of thought. Indeed, the founders felt so strongly about freedom of thought and conscience that even though many of them were far more religious than most are today, they tolerated heresy. Yes, even heresy, which they thought endangered your immortal soul of fate, a far more important matter to them than life or death. But they even tolerated that. They tolerated it not from moral relativism, but because you don't try to control the minds of others, and because they understood that the effort to do so leads to authoritarianism at, authoritarianism at best and tyranny at worst. My father's work also touched on this when he discussed, uh, stressed the importance of freedom and the importance of virtue as two of the great truths of Western civilization and the Judeo-Christian ethic. They are sometimes in tension, but both are true yesterday, today, and almost certainly tomorrow. To meet our many challenges, we need more good people committed to the constitutional structure that the founders established and to their belief in freedom of conscience and thought. It has been part of the Federal Society's goal to think hard about these issues and discuss them energetically and to strongly encourage and incentivize more good and capable people to be seriously involved in public policy, just as it has been NR's and Bill Buckley's goal to foster such discussion. That shared goal makes me and the Federal Society especially honored to receive this award. One final thought. Our founders, whom I've mentioned a couple of times, faced very different challenges, but ones at least as great as ours. As President Reagan pointed out, quote, a fellow named James Allen once wrote in his diary, many thinking people believe America has seen its best days. He wrote that July 26, 1775. Each age has its own challenges. But as President Reagan also said, quote, we were meant to be masters of our destiny, not victims to, of our fate. Close quote. It falls to all of us here today to succeed in inspiring enough good people to think and to insist on thinking. If we do so, and we can do so, in President Reagan's words, America's best days and NRs and the Federal Society's are yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a privilege to receive this prize with my friend and former colleague, Gene Meyer. But we are really stand-ins for the real recipients. With this award, the National Review Institute has recognized the hard work and accomplishments of the entire conservative legal movement, as well as those who support it. It is a wonderful way to acknowledge the so many people who have done so much to preserve our republic and it has been rewarding to serve alongside them. Though he was not a lawyer, 
There are few people who have done more to transform America's legal culture than William F. Buckley. He praised, and I quote, the intuitive wisdom of the founders, and he endeavored to respect that wisdom by protecting the Constitution they gave us. With National Review, he inspired, he helped to inspire multiple generations of law students and lawyers and legal scholars and judges to take up the task of restoring the proper understanding of our founding charter. The magazine even played a part in my own formation. I first na read National Review as a teenager in the early to mid 1980s. Its correct depiction of the Supreme Court's judicial overreach deeply troubled me. Its stalwart defense of the Constitution's original meaning convinced me. It wasn't long before I joined the effort to transform the legal culture by working at the Federalist Society. The conservative legal movement has one goal, the same as the rest of the conservative project. We seek a society that upholds human dignity and individual freedom, the true promise of the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution is a primary means to that end, as the founders themselves understood. Now, when most people think of the Constitution, they think of the Bill of Rights or of the three branches of government. These are very important. But what's even more important is the space between the Constitution's words and the clash between its institutions. There we find checks and balances, the separation of powers and federalism. These are the internal and external controls on those who wield power over us. Without these restraints, there is nothing to stop the state from running roughshod over our liberty. Yet with those restraints, the American people are free to, to flourish, pursue the good, and attain happiness. This structural constitution reflects the true genius of the founders, yet it has faced a sustained assault for the better part of a century. Judicial overreach by the left has deliberately undermined the constitution's structure, endangering our liberty in profound ways. The conservative legal movement arose to restore and enforce the structural limits on government power. And that's the essence of originalism. And our success is essential to the freedom and future of every American. Our success was distant when I first picked up uh, my first copy of National Review. You could count the number of originalist judges on one hand. Yet today, the federal bench is brimming with them, and originalists comprise a clear majority on the highest court in the land. In the past few years, the Supreme Court has begun to restore the structural constitution. It has taken bold steps to constrain the administrative state, enforce restrictions on congressional power, and reinforce the division between Washington and the 50 states. In a similar way, when it comes to religious freedom and political speech, the court has addressed those liberties by courageously placing clear, strong limits on the exercise of government power. The strengthening of an emphasis on the structural constitution is leading to better protection of our fundamental liberties and traditional cultural tenets, as it was designed, designed to do. Now more needs to be done, much more. Yet it's undeniable that the court is doing more to protect human dignity and individual freedom than at any point since the 1960s. For the first time in any of our lives, the Supreme Court is in the process of restoring the Constitution to its rightful place. But a word of caution is in order. The more our legal movement has achieved, the more some have come to expect of the courts. The more victories we've won, the more future fights we want to win, and the more impatient some have become. We must be wary of the temptation to ask originalism to shoulder more work than is practical or appropriate, or worse, to jettison our philosophy altogether because it fails to give us everything we want when we want it. Few things are more unhelpful. Sadly, that temptation is making the rounds. Some well-meaning conservatives are attempting to justify a much more expansive role for judges under the guise of better originalism. 
Now, while they do not go into the details, they say they want the courts to prioritize the health, safety, prosperity, and even the morality of our country. Many of the things they want are worthy, yet their suggested means run counter to the central premise of our movement. Now, it may seem strange that I am counseling against too much reliance on the courts. This is an awards dinner recognizing the Federalist Society, and after all, aren't I supposed to make the conservative legal movement see, seem indispensable and larger than life? Now, as tempting as that is, originalism is premised on the idea that the courts have a limited purpose. Judges are not meant to solve our country's biggest problems. That's the work of the elected branches of governments and private cultural institutions. They are best suited to the hard work of fashioning virtuous policy and a virtuous public. And while they will no doubt make mistakes, the alternative, judicial overreach, would be much worse. It's dangerous when progressive use unelected judges to impose moral relativism on society and overrule the democratic process. It is also dangerous for conservatives to ask judges to do too much and to go too far. Trans transforming the legal culture and the courts remains important. And I anticipate many more victories in the weeks, months, and years ahead. The courts are key to protecting human dignity. But we must also remember that the courts are not the only key. Faithful readers of National Review will know this. As the magazine has long acknowledged and demonstrated, conservatism's victory will come from several different fields of battle, not merely the judiciary. There is the theater of politics with the election of principled conservative leaders with proper sensibilities and character. There is also the renewal of our culture through a vibrant civil society, including the family and religious institutions. It matters how we form the next generation and what principles they love and what practices they learn. If we do not win the fight for our culture, it doesn't matter who we elect or what judges we appoint. They can only hold the line for so long. But if we renew the culture, we can defend human dignity and individual freedom for generations to come. Fl <laughs> Flip open any issue of National Review, and you will read a call to arms on all of these fields of battle, legal, political, and cultural. It deserves our thanks for deftly contributing to conservative advances on each front. Now is the time to press our advantage and bring our country closer to the conservative vision of liberty, justice, and dignity for all. We desire nothing more, and the American people deserve nothing less. Thank you again for this prize, and thank you for your dedication to a most noble cause.